Welcome students uh, to our class on law and social transformation. Today we are going to discuss with religion and the law. India is a land of religious pluralism. Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Sikh, Sikhism, Christianity and several other religions have been coexisting and growing side by side in Indian society since ancient times. The Hindus constitute the largest segment of population, nearly 73%, the Muslims nearly 12%, and the Sikhs are about 2%. Religious diversity plays an important role in politics. Secularism incorporated maxims like equality of all religions, and the absence of a state religion testifies to this reality of Indian politics. No Indian religion advocates violence and exclusiveness against each other. Yet in the name of various religious violence, religions, violence often erupts in different parts of India. We regularly face the loss of human life and precious resources because of aggressive and biotic clashes between the forces of Hindu communalism, Muslim communalism and Christian communalism. Religion is a social phenomenon, distinctive, and each has its own center of population. Transformations within the religion occur in the course of social development due to reformative movements, emergence of alternative faiths, rise of new leadership, impact of other cultures, and efforts of modernization. Religion as a divisive factor. Basically, religion is for spiritual guidance of the people and hence can be a major resource for peace and social justice. It is a powerful option for the weaker section of society. Instead, religion has more often been used by powerful vested interests of which religious functionaries become a part. Worst, religious functionaries and priests themselves create powerful establishments and join hands with politicians to protect their establishment. You can take an example of Asharam Bapu. Religious fanaticism, which is also called as religious fanatics. Secularism in India is based on the rich heritage and culture steeped in its various religions. The secular fabric of the country is very well reflected in the phrase Vasudev Kutumbakam, which means that the whole world is one family. India has always been an inclusive society which has welcomed people of all religions and faith with open arms, never discriminating among religious and never considering any religion or faith to be a threat. But this secular fabric has not meant that there is no communalism in India. Somebody has beautifully arranged these words in such a way that a complete India forms out of all these six religions. There is one temple at Kashirahu. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's a Hindu temple, but it incorporated a Hindu spire, a Jain cupola, Buddhist stupa, and a Muslim-style dome in place of a usual Shikara temple. You can see this is a unique temple, combination of having an accommodation of domes of different kinds of religions. And this this showed that in our ancient period we were all together exercising all kinds of and our own religious activities. This is another example Ajanta and Elura Caves in Aurangabad, a World Heritage Site are in the Indian state of Maharashtra. The 35 caves were carved into the vertical face of the Charanandri hills between the 5th and the 10th centuries. The 12 Buddhist, Buddhist caves, 17 Hindu caves and 5 Jain caves built in proximity suggest religious coexistence and secular sentiments for diversity prevalent during the pre-Islamic period of India. 
in spite of number of laws treating people all religions at par of at par india has had a long history of communal rights the worst of them being at the time of partition of uh, our country when blood flowed like a river why why there was a need the answer to this question lies in british rule of country particularly in post 1857 Prior to 1857, the British rulers restrained themselves from interfering in the social structure of the country. Post 1857, they realized the importance of dividing the people of the country in order to weaken them. This gave rise to the divide and rule policy which they used on religious lines, thus distancing Hindus and Muslims. I hear you can see the two pictures. This one. is about the rebellion of 1857 and this is where they lost the battle and the british took them in custody the policy of the british resulted in the painful partition of the country and displacement of a large number of people from their homes this has continued even after the independence of the country in spite of government being neutral as far as religion is concerned and the constitution ensuring that there is no discrimination on the basis of religion as far as employment education etc are concerned and these are the pictures from partition <clears throat> in the time of partition of india people had a lot of hardship to face and uh, and and we are unlucky to get pakistan divided from us which was part of india once upon a time this and 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 due to the separation from our country pakistan has become a number one enemy of india which was once upon a time part of india this is all due to british policy of divided rule this happened due to lack of social interaction such a social interaction is especially more important to heal the scars and pain of partition this situation was sought to be remedied through the provisions of the constitution the pain of the partition re- revisited the country in the form of a communal rights from time to time as if not let people forget their wants the action or inaction of the political leaders and the administrative system at times also added to the communal frenzy some major events which have changed the way world viewed india were based on communal frenzy namely babri masjid demolition december 1992 the gujarat riot 2002 delhi sikh riot 1984 now we already we, all of us know what is babri masjid uh, massacre or the demolition of babri masjid it is located at ayodhya in uttar pradesh It was demolished on December 6, 1992, by car civics, under the guidance of some of the leaders who are facing trial in the case. At present, the demolition of the Babri Masjid made the fabled respect of all religions that Indians have a thing of the past. The fact that the religion, religious shrine of any religion, could be demolished raised questions about the secularity of the people of the country. as also the conviction of the state towards secularism then comes the gujarat riots in 2002 the gujarat riots in 2002 is a matter of great shame for the country the fact that people were massacred only on account of their belonging to a particular religion is unacceptable in any secular nation the fact that the administration re- reacted late also raises questions regarding the state's belief in secularism As far as Delhi Sikh riots are concerned, which took place in 1984, prior to Gujarat riots, the riots of Delhi in 1984 was another shame of our nation. Sikhs were Sikh were brutally slaughtered on the streets of Delhi just because the person who assassinated them, uh, the then Prime Minister Minister, Minister of India, Shrimati Indira Gandhi, happened to be a Sikh. It is ironic that this killing happened to exact revenge for the death of the person of the persons who was instrumental in incorporating the word word secular in the Indian Constitution. In fact, one cannot take values of 
one religion and compare it with history of other. Values must be compared with values and history must be compared with history. While values are divine, humanitarian and common to all religions, history is full of violence perpetrated by various wasted interests, power struggle within of two or more faith communities and often represents the worst side of human behavior. It should not be blamed on religion. Therefore, what happens in history should not be taken as representative of religious values or religious norms, much less its cause. These massacres and killing represent nothing but lust for power and wealth by some followers of that religion. It has nothing to do with the teachings of that religion. Every religion gives us certain norms and values to improve our conduct and to make us good or even perfect human beings. It is true religion it is misused by all sorts of interests and more often than not. It is sought to be misused as it strongly appeals to our emotions and can easily create a feeling of we versus they. But nevertheless it is misused and for misuse we cannot blame religion. As Ashgar Ali, engineer, rightly puts it, let us be very clear on one thing, that no religion would be acceptable to people just because it allows killing or conversion. A religion is acceptable only if improved, if it improves morality, controls basic instincts, and brings about spiritual and moral change for better. It is extremely naive to believe that a religion would spread by a sword. Religion and terrorism, what is the connection? The supreme law of the land rightly described India as a secular country in which the state has no religion and nor does it seek to promote or discourage any religion or religious belief. It guarantees a complete religious freedom with the absence of any compulsion whatsoever in religious matters. That is, there is no official religion. The state is committed to a policy of non-interference in religious matters. Religion is a matter of personal beliefs and convictions. But how far are we, the people of India, secular in thought, would and did, word and deed? Upon a close observation of the working of our political parties, we shall find that candidates for elections are often chosen on communal consideration. consideration. Hindu candidates for constituencies having maximum Hindu electorates. Muslim candidates for areas where the large number of the voters are Muslims. Although the political parties are not formed on a religious basis, we often find that there are some distinctly communal parties in this secular country. Religion should have no connection whatsoever in politics, but it is really so in India today. Overtact of fanatic is to cause injury to other in such a way that the enjoyment of human rights of the individual as well as the society at large is impaired. Therefore, leads to terrorism. Terrorism is a global phenomenon. No doubt it has direct impact on human beings with shattering loss of life to right to life, liberty and physical integrity of victims. In addition to this individual loss, terrorism has destabilized governments, weakened civil society, jeopardized peace and security and threaten social and economic development. The United Nations General Assembly in the open sessions of their 53rd meeting explained terrorism in the following words. In its wider sense, terrorism is the tactic of using an act or threat of violence against individuals or groups to change the outcome of some process of politics. The basic question is, why at all terrorism has grown so fast and steadily? Why is it a threat to the civil society? Who is responsible for the growth of terrorism? Is it the religious fanatics or fundamentalists or politicians or business class? Secularism has a solution to the problem. Secularism is one of the most important national goals. Though secularism has been an official government policy, bulk of people in India still remain non-secular. Communalism and terrorism are big threats to secularism. If you continue with this history, the English word secular is derived from the Latin and a word called as seculum, 
Early in monarchical countries, secularists were described as republicans. The French Revolution, said in 1789, popularized the idea of secularism. The French Constitution of 1791 introduced the idea of secular state. Great Indians like Mughal King Akbar, social and religious reformers like Rajaram Mohan Rai and Swami Vivekananda respected the people of all religions. Particularly Indian King Maharaja Ranjit Singh officially announced secularism as the policy of his government. He was successful in this regard. Ranjit Singh is considered as the forerunner in implementing the idea of secularism through government means. In the year 1988, the Indian National Congress opened a debate on secularism and on secularism and proposed secular nationalism for India. The idea of secularism began in Indian politics in 1920 when Mahatma Gandhi organized Caliphate movement in support of Sultan of Turkey. French Revolution of 1789. This is one of the picture. Then we have Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who looked like this. And this is about the Khilaf movement and non-cooperation movement. Secularism. As Jawaharlal Nehru wrote in his autobiography, no word perhaps in any language is more likely to be interpreted in different ways by the people as the word religion. That being the case, secularism, which is a concept evolved in relation to religion, can also not have the same connotation for all. Two models of seclusion. There are two possible models of seclusion. In the first one, there is a complete separation of religion and the state to the extent that there is an impassable wall between religion and secular spheres. In such a model, there is no state intervention of religious matters and vice versa. In the other model, all religions are to be treated equally by the state. In other words, the state is equidistant from all religions. This model is also referred to as non-discriminatory and is particularly relevant for multi-religious societies. In contrast to the form of the model, the latter allows for state intervention on the ground of public order and social justice. For example, abolition of triple talaq. True meaning of secularism. Secularism as a modern political and constitutional principle involves two basic propositions. The first is that people belong to different faiths and sects are equal before the law the constitution and the government policy. Secondly, the second requirement is that there can be no mixing up of religion and politics. It follows that there can be no discrimination against anyone on the basis of religion or faith, nor is there room for the hegemony of one religion or the religion of major majority sentiments and aspirations. It is in this double sense, no discrimination against anyone on ground of faith and separation of religion from politics that our constitution safeguards secularism. Reform the law on secular lines. Problems. The Constituent Assembly, which was constituted to frame a constitution for India, declared eight guiding principles of Indian constitution. Among these eight basic and guideline, guiding principles of the constitution, secularism is placed in the fifth position. To what extent the constitution pundits gave importance for Secularism, the idea of secularism is essential to maintain unity in diversity. Secularism is a basic ideology for the effective functioning of a healthy democracy. When the Indian constitution was adopted in January 1950, it has got sufficient provisions to promote secularism. The constitution of India firmly believes in the principles of secularism. The founding fathers of the Indian constitution never hesitated to build India on secular foundations. They, they oppose and defeated the amendment of Mr. H. P. Kalmut to invoke the name of God in the preamble of the Constitution. Pandit Kunjuru said that we invoke the name of God, but I, I am bold to say that while we do so, we are showing a narrow sectarian spirit which is contrary to the spirit of the Constitution. The Indian flag consists of a Shok Chakra in its center. The wheel has many spokes, but all are of equal length. In indirective, it indirectly refers to the Indian stand on the principle of equal treatment of all religions. Sarva Dharma Samabhava. This is how Sarva Dharma Samabhava is treated like a tricolor.
flag. Only the word secular was not there initially in the constitution. A mere perusal of the various articles of it would have amply demonstrate that secularism is an integral part of the Indian constitution. Article 14 of the constitution provides for equality before law for all people. Article 15 in the area lays down that the state shall not discriminate any citizens on the ground of religion. Article 16 provides for equality of opportunity matters of employment under the state irrespective of religion. Article 25 provides for freedom of conscience and the right to profess practice propagate the religion of one's choice. The constitution not only guarantees a person's freedom of religion and conscience, but also ensures freedom for one who has no religion, and it surreptitiously, uh, scrupulously, sorry, restrains the state from making any discrimination on the ground of religion. Article 26 provides freedom to manage religious affairs. Article 27 prohibits compulsion to pay taxes to benefit any religion, religious denominations. The impact of secularism can also be seen in Article 21, 28, which states that no religion inst instruction shall be proved provided in any educational institution wholly maintained out of state funds. The analysis of the above said constitution provision makes, makes it amply clear that Indian secularism is unique and it treats all the religions alike. In, order, in, in our country, judiciary is the guardian of the Constitution and it has been held by the Supreme Court that secularism is a basic structure for the Constitution and it cannot be altered by the Constitutional Amendment. It will be worthwhile to look into one important judgment given by the Supreme Court of India, namely Keshavananda Bharti v. State of Kerala. In this case, was decided by the full constitutional bench of judges on April 24th, 1973, by a water thin majority of seven to six. The Supreme Court held that the power to amend the constitution in Article 368 couldn't be exercised in such a manner as to destroy or emasculate the fundamental features of the constitution. Important judgments. If a person purposely purposefully undertakes the conversion of another person to his religion as distinguished from his efforts to transmit or spread the tenets of his religion that would impugn on the freedom of conscience guaranteed to all citizens of the country alike, as decided in the Rev. Reverend Stainless was a scent of, scent of Madhya Pradesh. The Supreme Court in Punjab Rao was a D.P. Meshanam held in 1966, expresses that the right is not only to entertain such a religious belief as may be uh, approved by his judgment or conscience, but also to exhibit his sentiments in overt acts as are enjoyed by religion. In the words of article, he may profess a religion means the right to declare freely and openly one's faith. In Ratinal Panchan, Gandhi was a state of uh, Bombay, held in 1954, declares that he may freely practice his religion, religious practices or performances of acts and presumes of religious belief are as much a part of religion as faith or belief in particular doctrines. Rituals and observance, ceremonies and modes of worship considered by religion to be its integral and essential part are also secured. What is integral and essential part of religion or religious practice has to be decided by the courts with reference to the doctrine of particular religion. Include practice regarded by the community as part of its religion as put forth by the Honorable Supreme Court in Seshmal versus State of Tamil Nadu. Again in Ratilal, the Supreme Court states that he may propagate freely his religious views for the uh, edification of others. It, it is immaterial also whether a person makes the propagation in his individual capacity or on behalf of some church or institution. In another famous case, Bijay Emanuel was a state of Kerala and which was decided in 1987, also known as National Anthem Case. The Supreme Court has upheld the religious belief of the Jehovah Witnesses, a Christian community, not to praise anybody but for his own, or her own embodiment of God. 
Oh, we'll just go through some uh, some of the few facts of this case. On July 8, 1985, it began like any other school day for three children in a small town in Kerala in the southwest re region of India. But on this day, the school's headmistress ordered that national anthem, Janagana Mana, be sung in the classroom. All in attendance were required to stand and sing. But 15-year-old Bijoy and his younger sisters, Binu Mo, age 13, and Bindu, age 10, did not comply with the orders. As Jehovah's Witnesses, they, their conscience would not permit them to sing because they sincerely believed that doing so would constitute a form of idolatry and an act of unfaithfulness to their God, that is, Jehovah. This is a uh, family of Bijo Imanuel and his family. Restrictions on the freedom of religion. Restrictions to the enjoyment of right to religion. Right to religion guarantees under Article 25 is not an absolute right. Like other rights, this right too can be restricted for the purpose of maintaining public order, morality, and health. States power to make laws for providing for social welfare and social reform, even though they might interfere with the religious practices. In S.P. Mithalos' State of Union of India, sorry, the government enacted the Aurovili, that is Emergency Provisions Act, to take away the management of Aurobindo society property on the ground of mismanagement of affairs. The petitioners challenged the validity of the said act on the ground that it violates Article 25 and 26 of the Constitution. The court held that teachings of Aurobindo did not constitute religion and therefore taking of Aurobindo ashram did not infringe the society's right under Article 25 and 26. It further held that even if it was assumed that the society were a religious denomination, the Act did not infringe its rights under Article 25 and 26. The Act has taken only the right of management of property of or really in respect of secular matters, which can be regulated by law. In yet another case, Muhammad Hanif Quraysh used the state of Bihar. The petitioner claimed that the sacrifices of cows on the occasion of Bakrid was an essential part of his religion. And therefore, the state law forbidding the slaughter of a cow was a violation of his right to practice religion. Court rejected the arrangement, so the argument, and held that sacrifice of cow on Bakrid day was not an essential part of the Mohammedan religion and hence could be prohibited by state under Clause C, 2A of Article 25. In another case, state of West Bengal versus Ashutosh Lehri, Supreme Court held that the slaughter of cows on Bakri Day is optional and not obligatory. It is not essential or required for religious purpose of Muslim. Article 25 deals with essential religious practices. State acting towards social welfare and social reforms. Under Clause 2B of Article 25, the state is empowered to make laws for social welfare and social reforms. Under this, the state can eradicate those evil practices which are under the guise and name of the religion. For example, the Devadasi system, the Sati system, etc. The Supreme Court in Shastri Yagna Purushadasi Mul, uh, versus Muldas Bandadas Vaishya makes it clear that the state cannot regulate the manner in which the worship of the deity is performed. Whereas it justifies the banning of polygamy among Hindu in the state of Bombay versus Narsu. What the courts have tried to do is to separate religious activities and social and secular activities. The former are protected under Article 25, the latter are not. In Ismail Farik versus the Unit of India, decided in 1994, Supreme Court has tried to differentiate between essential parts of religious practice. It has held that often offer of prayer or worship is a religious practice. Its offering at every location where such prayers can be offered would not be essential religious practice. What is protected under prior Articles 25 and 26 is a religious practice which forms an essential part of religious practice. Thus, <clears throat> a place of worship may be acquired by the state in exercise of its supreme power. Thus, places of worship be it temples, mosques, or churches, can be acquired. 
rights of minorities, right to manage religious affairs. Article 26 says that, subject to public order, morality, and health, every religious denomination of any section have the following rights. Number one, to establish and maintain institutions for religious and charitable purposes, to manage its own affairs in the matters of religion, to own and acquire movable and immovable property, to administer such property in accordance with the law. There's one case here, S. Aziz Basha versus Union of India. The Supreme Court held that the Aligarh University was not established by the Muslim minority and therefore it could not claim the right to maintain it. It was established under the statute of passed by the parliament. <clears throat> the court has the right to determine whether a particular rite or ceremony is regarded as an essential part or tenet of the particular religion. The matters of religion means that secular activities connected with the religious institution can be regulated by the state. The places of worship like temples, mosques, gurudwaras cannot be used for hiring criminals or carrying on anti-national activities. They cannot be used for political purposes. The state has power under Article 25, 1, Clause 1 and Clause 2 to prohibit their activities in the places of worship. In a theist society of India, Nalgonda district branch, which is government of Andhra Pradesh, British or atheist society of India prayed for issuing a writ of manifest directing the state government to prohibit breaking of coconuts for performing of puja, chanting of mantras or sutras of different religions in religious functions are organized by the state. The Andhra Pradesh High Court rejected their prayer and held that these activities have been a part of the Indian tradition and hence are meant to invoke the blessings of Almighty for the success of the project, uh, project undertaken. Such noble thought cannot be found fault with as offensive to anyone. Maybe that the petitioner society who claim to be the atheist do not appreciate invocation of God as they do not believe in God. Religious minorities and the law, right to religion, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 94, it recognizes the right to religion in Article 18, which says that everyone has the right to freedom, thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others in public or private, manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. That makes it clear that an individual who is born free also has freedom to manifest his religion, religious belief as he is free to practice any religion. Either he automatically adopts the religion practices, practiced by his parents after his birth or um, has freedom to choose his own. It is his absolute choice to profess his religion in private, and if he wishes, he may join any religious groups. Civil and Political Convention, 1966. In the Civil and Political Covenant, 1960, the right to religion is discussed as follows. Article 18. Everyone shall have the right to freedom and thought, conscience, and religion. This right shall include freedom to have and adopt or adopt a religion or belief of his choice and freedom either individual or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or rebel in worship, observance, practice and teach. No one shall be subject to coercion which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. Freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed. The state parties to the present covenant undertakes to have respect for the liberty of parents and, when applicable, declare a guardian to ensure the religious and moral education of their children in community with their own convictions. Declaration on Religious Discrimination, 1981 the declaration, declaration on the elimination of all forms of intolerance and discussion based on religion or belief adopted by General Assembly of the United Nations in 1980 states in Article 1, everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This might have included, include, shall include freedom to have a religion or whatever belief of his choice. No one shall be subject to caution. 
freedom to manifest one's religion or belief may be subject to only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to public safety. A right not to be taxed to promote a religion. Individual freedom of religion is further threatened by Article 27, prohibiting religious taxation. Article 27, no person shall be compelled to pay any taxes, the proceeds of which are specifically appropriated in payment of expenses for the common or maintenance of any particular religion or religious denominations. This one case to maintain the secular character, the constitution guarantees freedom of religion to individuals and groups, but it is against the general policy of the constitution that any money being paid out of public funds for promoting and or maintaining any particular religions, religion as stated in commission, Commissioner HRE versus LT Swaminar. Restrictions on religious instruments in education, educational institution, Article 28. No religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution, wholly maintained or out of state funds. Nothing in Clause 1 shall apply to an educational institution which is administered by the state but has been established under any endowment or trust. Third, no person attending any educational institution recognized by the state or receiving aid out of state funds shall be required to take part in any religious instru instructions that may be imparted in such institution. Cultural and Educational Rights The Constitution keeps the spirit of secularism by making a space to all the religious protecting the interests of minorities. Article 29 and 30 guarantees certain cultural and educational rights to cultural, religious and linguistic minorities. Article 29, any section of the citizen residing in the territory of India or any part thereof of India uh, having a distinct language, script, culture of its own shall have the right to conserve the same. No one shall be denied admission into any educational institution maintained by the state or receiving aid out of state funds on grounds only of religion, race, caste, language or any other form. Article 30 deals with all minorities, whether based on religion or language, shall have the right to establish an educational institution of their choice. State shall not interfere. So, with these few words, I would like to stop here. So, wish you the same. I wish, wish you all the best. And kindly go through my PPT. And as far as chapter 2 is concerned, no, um, that, that's the final uh, word from me. I wish you all the best and uh, see you in the next class. Thank you so much.